things that uh, we've seen missing um, and then uh, just trying to um, you know um, spark some uh, interest in uh, in the community about um, the the operation side of Matterhorn and uh, so that's the I hope it can be more of a, an interactive uh, session where you know we um, throw ideas at each other I certainly don't have <laughs> all the answers I have some but I certainly have a lot of questions and um, things I, I uh, hope that um, that get heard today but yeah thank you um, first of all I want to apologize to those watching the the live stream and or the recording uh, because basically uh, we want this to be more interactive. This is why probably we won't be able to pass the mic around for any question. So you can see that the presentation mode here is now different in that Jaime is sitting over there. And we want you to actually talk to him. And you don't have to wait for the mic. If you, if you can, then that's uh, polite. Uh, but we want, don't want to prevent the, the interactivity um, uh, here in this place. Um, can I have a, a show of hands from those who are not going to stay here, who would have time for a parallel session? What about the developers? Are they all staying here, or would you consider continuing a discussion? I wouldn't know. Please give me a hint at least. Have all the issues around the release cycle been resolved? Have all the tickets been dealt with? Uh, have you been talking to the Avalon people? Have you been talking about, uh, what was it, LTI? Um, have you been talking to Rüdiger about his plans for the future, like I have last night? I, I hate to say this, but this is really um, important for developers, what Jaime is talking about. It's about actually running a Matterhorn system, and I don't think we can be producing you know, software that can run if we don't know how, how it's being run. So I, I suggest for developers to stay and um, maybe use um, tomorrow's deep dive. And probably this um, afternoon, the uh, Capture Agent Showcase, while I would uh, encourage everyone to look at the Capture Agents, of course, I think that some of the developers could use that time as well. Um, but if that's true, what you're saying, I have no doubt to, uh, as far as that, um, then basically you stay here and we, we don't form any breakout groups at the moment. Okay. So all over to you, Jaime. Okay, oops, uh, that's really loud. Um, uh, I'm Jamie Gago, I'm a systems engineer with Antwine, and um, this uh, session that hopefully is uh, interactive is about running, uh, what it takes to run a, a Matterhorn cluster in, in a production environment, close to what we call you know, an enterprise environment, um, you, you name it. Um, I'm gonna stay at, at, try to stay at a high level, 
Um, there are certain things that um, I can certainly dive technically, and, and uh, if that's the, 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 the request, the consensus, uh, I'm thinking about things like uh, our um, RPM package or um, our build pipeline. So I'd be more than happy if, uh, if that's of any interest. Um, so yeah, uh, not, not too deep, but certainly some technical um, details involved. Um, could I get just a quick um, raise hands about who consider themselves here as developers? Okay. Uh, more of operation people? Good. And then uh, management? Uh, good. Okay. Well, that was a good, uh, good split. Okay, so... Um, um, I guess the, the first um, slide, and people that have been uh, in this project um, for longer than me can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think the legacy of Matterhorn is um, originally there uh, was not such, um, there was, wasn't too much of a, um, an involvement of, from uh, operational people, sysadmin and so like. So um, a lot of things that uh, could have been uh, raised at that time um, had to wait that Matterhorn was ready to uh, deploy for uh, this to uh, come up. So um, this uh, certainly, from my perspective, led to um, things missing. And um, if you look at um, many um, points, it, it's, you know, we, we have to say, we have, we have to just said, you know, it's, it's just not pretty. From the operation side, there's, there's a lot of um, things that are um, uh, missing. So first of all, um, I think operation people are not being um, um, organized in a, in a structured way that they can provide their feedback um, to, to the developers so that there's, you know, the, the traditional wall of confusion is right there uh, for, for Matterhorn. Uh, it's, you know, there's tickets here, emails to the list there, but, but there is no um, um, uh, feedback coming from the people uh, operating Matterhorn that is, um, at least not from my perspective. Uh, if, um, if we think about um, the meetings we have, um, um, there's the adopters meeting, and that could be maybe the area for the operations people. And there's the developers meeting. So um, you can't really expect people to come to a develop the developers meeting other than developers, right? So um, the first time I heard about the developers meeting, that's, I didn't think that was the place for me to be. I, think, I thought that this was going to be a discussion about, you know, whatever, Java classes and, and so forth. So, um, I think that the, the, the operations people don't, don't really know where, where they should interact with, with the community, what's their place. Uh, again, you know, the list, <clears throat> the list or opening tickets, but, you know, so, so that's, um, that's one thing. And uh, so this has led also to um, when Matterhorn was built and, and its current state, it, it doesn't really take care of, of this uh, different operation, uh, operational um, people. Um, someone that is scheduling is considered an operations people in, in the operations world. You know, they're going at the Matterhorn UI and they're scheduling. But then you have someone that is um, dealing with their workflows, and that could also be an operations people uh, functionality. So um, the, the, the breaking down of uh, the different operations functions of Matterhorn uh, does not appear uh, first thing. So it, it's, a, it's a big you know, that's one admin UI for everybody to uh, get there. So um, then you get the development-oriented deployment methodologies. We were just talking about this in, in the deep dive. Um, compiling on, on, on the local machines. Um, I mean, compiling on the, on the production machines. Um, the profiles are, are Maven-defined, you know, typically as an operations person building a, a certain cluster, um, 
you usually have a configuration file where you can specify or um, you have a, a user interface where you can say, well, this um, node is whatever that type of, uh, you know, a worker or uh, an admin or an engage or, or so forth. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know if uh, we need to go through this. The operations documentation is quite incomplete. Um, and also, it's, it's a little confusing. So we were just talking about the workflow operation handlers. If we want operations people to deal with the configuration of Matterhorn, and if we consider that workflows are a configuration part of Matterhorn and not a, a development part of Matterhorn, then certainly th there's an effort that needs to happen there. So the um, people that are supposed to be able to write workflows can actually write those workflows. Um, the logging, uh, Tobias has been uh, covering this. Um, we, we can do all kinds of um, work around logging, and I'll talk a little bit about, about this, but if, if the log statements uh, if are not there, um, it's going to be problematic. And um, I don't know what, what the community uh, thinks about this, but uh, one, is, one of the things is, you know, you're starting Matterhorn, there's no log statement that says, you know, it started. It's just as, as simple as that. And um, I think th this kind of um, problems are actually go across the board. You know, they come from operations people, but then um, developers could also use this kind of um, improvement just for themselves. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the upgrade path. Um, that's quite tough for, for your operation folks that there is no upgrade path missing in action, so that certainly doesn't help. The admin UI, yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, um, we're all together on the same boat, and, and really it's not, you know, it's, it's not about um, me like pointing out all these issues. It's just like these things are, are missing or uh, they're not correct, and um, we want to do something about it, I think, all of us. You know, it's the same boat. And we all go in the same direction, so uh, we want to as well row in the same uh, direction. And so, uh, luckily, I mean, uh, I, I would have to hope that you know um, help is on the way. You know, the, I don't know if you heard about the DevOps movement. Um, that's certainly something that um, we've uh, um, done. I mean, those DevOps processes in place at, at Antoine, and it certainly has helped. Um, uh, level up the, the, the quality of uh, our um, Matterhorn uh, installations um, in production. So what I'm not going to get too deep about DevOps. A uh, quick uh, show of hands. Who has heard about the DevOps uh, movement or community? OK. One. <laughs> well, just uh, check it out. It's, it's, um, you're, if it, it's it's worth the, the look. There's a lot of uh, resources, and I'll talk a little about. So it, it's mainly a, a, a focus on collaboration between teams and breaking those silos. And I think uh, right now the community is very siloed with the developers and then uh, the operations sparse all over the different um, uh, universities or organizations. Uh, there's the idea of continuous deployment. I'm not going to get too far into this. And, and then there's uh, the DevOps moments as, as an explosion of tools that uh, can be leveraged. And we've leveraged some at Antwine, and there's many other that could be leveraged. So um, that's, uh, you, you, it's, yeah, it's just like, it seems like every day there's a new tool that comes out and um, that it's better than the next one. So uh, for those of you that, you know, like Redlock2, Logstash, Chef, Jenkins, Puppet, Travis, Vagrant, Randek, I mean, yeah. CACT, um, Kibana, that's, you name it. There's, there's a lot. So um, this is a little small, but um, this is a kind of a, an ideal release pipeline. And um, our Antoine pipe release pipeline had an overview. And the idea behind it is that to automate everything, I mean, at least as much as you can. So well, I mean, you guys know the benefits of automation, whether you're a developer or, or operations. Um, you know, it removes a lot of human error. I mean, uh, I, I don't think 
I need to uh, convince anybody here that automation is uh, helpful. So the idea is uh, developer gets uh, uh, push new code, um, the version control system. We use uh, Git, but uh, certainly becoming quite of a kind of a standard in, in uh, this area. Um, kicks uh, an, an automated build. Um, we use Jenkins. Uh, again, open source software, very, <coughs> very stable, very robust. Um, it's kind of a role model. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later. Then uh, we haven't that part implemented yet, but um, the idea is from this uh, build to uh, spawn a, an ephemeral staging environment using a virtual environment, using uh, tools like Vagrant, um, deploying using, uh, provisioning the virtual machine using um, a configuration management tool such as Chef or Puppet. Um, at this point, there's a QA process. Uh, there's certainly room for automation there with things like Selenium. Um, once this QA is validated, we go to a, a release, right? We, we build a package, you know? We, we don't just push the code to a repo and say it's, it's ready. We create something that, is dis dis that can be distributed. And then from there, it, it's deployed on our production systems. Um, following standard deployment procedures uh, using tools uh, that are meant for uh, distributed environment. Yeah, so all my talk is uh, focused on distributed environment. Um, this is uh, about scaling your Matterhorn installation. Not, but not in one is great for certain purpose, but um, the scaling cannot happen if you're not in a distributed environment. So, I mean, that's one of the main attractions, I think, of Matterhorn. So, um, Okay, any questions so far? Am I going too fast or? No? Okay, no questions. Um, one quick thing about deployment to make sure we all agree here that pushing code and configuring are two separate uh, um, steps in, in the deployment. <coughs> it, it's important that um, we, we make that distinction, um, especially for the, the, the newcomers. Um, you see that Matterhorn has a lot of configuration points, and um, it's just not, you know, building and, and pushing jars. That's not going to take you very far. The, the configuration part is uh, there's a lot of uh, knowledge that that goes in there. Um, like we're talking about the uh, storage uh, layer. That that certainly is a, can be a challenging part. So, okay. So um, our so for for I'm talking here about Linux systems. Um, certainly, Windows and then uh, OS X have their own uh, delivery methods. But in the um, Linux world, the main uh, delivery methods for applications are uh, RPM and uh, Deb. So RPM is the Red Hat package manager. Goes with CentOS, Scientific Linux, etc. And Deb is more for Ubuntu, Debian, and uh, so forth. So <coughs> this was um, one of our uh, core um, focus for our release pipeline because um, it, it allowed the, the a standard automated way of deploying Matterhorn with a default <coughs> excuse me, configuration. Um, so for us, we uh, exclusively work with the uh, Red Hat style um, distribution, so CentOS, uh, Scientific Linux. But certainly what, what I'm going to talk about now can be uh, applied to uh, uh, Ubuntu style packages. So <coughs> when we first, um, when we started looking at uh, distributing a, a package for Motherhorn, um, the first thing that um, we had to solve was um, how do you deal with the in the distributed environment with what kind of uh, what type of node you want on your uh, host you know is this host gonna uh, deal with a, is it gonna be a worker node is it gonna be a engaged slash worker node etc so um, and we were already already going in, in a in a de define type of profiles uh, direction, 
Uh, so it, it wasn't too hard uh, to, to come to a conclusion that um, we needed a, a configuration uh, style of, for our uh, node. So our, our nodes are, are not um, built by outloading uh, through the file scanner um, all the jars that are in certain directory. We uh, configure the different type of nodes, and we have uh, uh, five so far through a configuration file. So what, what that means is um, uh, in the initialization script of uh, Matterhorn, we specify, and I don't know how um, familiar people are with these concepts or you know, start script or um, I think you know, we have quite a bit of technical people. So uh, either developer operations should know that you, know, you have a Matterhorn start script. So we are passing variables to it and um, the, instead of passing the official system properties, we're passing our own uh, profile uh, properties. And we have a worker properties, we have an admin properties, and engage. Um, we've been working on an ingest profile as well. Um, which those configuration files have hard coded the path to the jars that are required for an admin profile, for a worker profile. Uh, so our package actually contains everything, all the jars. When we build, we build everything and push that into a single package. And from that package, you can decide what type of node you're going to run. Um, it's uh, one way of doing things. Um, it, it works pretty well for us because then we, um, we just um, apt-get or yum in this case. We yum install Matterhorn and... So it's there, and when we need to update, we just do a yum update Matterhorn. And uh, f from a system administrator or operations uh, perspective, it's just orders of magnitude easier and, and more uh, maintainable, uh, <coughs> more sustainable. The thing is that we have to keep in mind is that um, the, the systems that Matterhorn is running, it's not running out of thin air, right? It's running on an operating system. These operating systems have standard when it comes to applications. And the standard for Ubuntu or for Red Hat is RPM or the dev. That's what the operating system expects wants to be fed. So not feeding it a package, it's okay, well, you might, you, that's, you're on your own, basically. With this, we can query the, the, data, the, the YUM database and see what's going on, what's the, the version that is installed, what are the files that are in there, and, and so forth. So um, I think that for us, it, it was a, a huge step forward to, to have that package. And um, <coughs> I think the, the, the infrastructure or the systems uh, administrator we deal with uh, our, our customers are, are quite happy to just have to do a YUM update to uh, uh, update their uh, Antwine um, Matterhorn uh, installation. Is there any question about this package? Um, yes? No? Am I, am I too technical? Am I staying too high? Uh, is, this, is that? OK. Well, so that's, that's a, the big thing. Um, Configure profiles, we specify on a configuration file, a text file, you know, that we can edit on the system and can say this is a worker, start Matterhorn and it starts as a worker. It's very different from the developer approach that um, is described on the wiki and that you guys do for, for many reasons. I understand that dropping a jar in, in, a, you know, in a folder and hot loading it, it's much more convenient, but you can see how this is, uh, from a production operation perspective, just much more um, sustainable. And um, you know, it, it's many, 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 many packages, many applications do it this way, uh, especially in the open source world. So I mean, I'm sure all of you have heard about packages. So that's a big, uh, big plus. And uh, there's uh, Osnabrück as a, uh, an RPM repository that is available. I, uh, so Rudiger posted on, on, the, on the list, and that was fine. But now it's just a mail on the list. And if you come new to Motorhorn, you know, um, 
I think this should be, you know, a standard that Matterhorn has an RPM and a DEB, and you can and you have a Matterhorn repository, and you can just install it from, you know, install the Matterhorn repository and then install the package. Um, certainly, there's other open source tools going that way, so I don't see why we could not do this. Um, profiling. Um, we uh, started recently um, including New Relic on our installations. Um, it's not open source, it's not free, but there are other solutions like Java Melody. Uh, you can plug that into a graphite or a cacti. Uh, I'm not saying that nobody's doing this. Hopefully, there's plenty of the developers have been profiling, but <clears throat> it, it's it doesn't seem to be a standard that you know the community is like communicating at least about hey what, what's the status of the um, database uh, when we're throwing our benchmark at it and um, this leaves people in operation with a little scared because we don't really know what's going to happen uh, when we start throwing a load at it right and um, and also just <coughs> Keep in mind that Matterhorn runs, it's usually it's going to run in, in a, it's, it's rare that you're going to have a fully dedicated environment for Matterhorn, right? You're going to have to deal with the network, uh, with the database, etc. And if this is not in place prior to the deployment, um, there's, there's a, a significant risk that you'll just be shut, I mean, that Matterhorn is just going to be shut down and everybody has you know, it's a lose-lose. Uh, the operations don't run Matterhorn, and the developer don't see their code in production, and it stays, you know, somewhere in the repository and doesn't get adopted. So, the the profiling, the performance tuning is is um is something that that needs to, uh, especially since it's distributed, it's a uh, it's a it's it's a heavy application. It's not just like you know, you're not installing Word, and so you want to know what's what's going to do if you deploy it on your database that it's running also your, I don't know, your, your main campus learning management system. So uh, I hope that the kind of standard that can be put in place, you know, that, hey, you know, we, we first, after a release, you know, or before uh, the risk candidate, we, we profile, we have a, a, a stress test, and then according to what we see in the, in the graphs, we're like, yeah, good to go, and we move on. So. Configuration management. Um, <laughs> I've been speaking a lot about this. Uh, it's uh, with with Antoine. It, it's, it's it's a huge plus. Many um, many many uh, IT infrastructures are are either converting or using already uh, Puppet or Chef or CF Engine. So if 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 there was a uh, I know I'm going to be working on the Matterhorn um, Chef cookbook, but um, that this um, Puppet manifest would be a great thing. You know, this just brings energy to, to the to the community and makes operations people. Oh wow, that's already you know. Um, I think the idea is just to get the adoption um, just uh, more vibrant and, and more um, engaging with this kind of um, um, you know candies that you could you know say, hey, yeah, we, we have a manifest for Puppet. Uh, Sussex, uh, the University of Sussex, I think, worked on the Puppet Manifest. I don't know what's the status, but um, anybody you know that that that's working on this, uh, I hope you know that that can be shared and and um, put somewhere. You know, have a you know, there's the the chef uh, community as a repository for this cookbook. So um, I certainly will will put the Antoine Marahon cookbook there. It's you know, it's, it's just it's all open source. So. Yeah, oh, yeah, yes, sure. So who knows uh, what, what configuration management sh chef slash um, puppet slash EF engine? Has it, you guys ever heard about it? No? Yeah, no? It, it's, um, so as I was saying, you know, when you deploy, you, you have this, you know, you push your code, uh, and then there's the configuration, like, well, my admin node URL is blah, 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 or I want the 
uh, my uh, HTTPD server to have mod proxy or, or SSL enabled, right? right? So um, for Matterhorn, it's um, this is the URI, this is the uh, the URI to my database and so forth. So when you have five servers, uh, you go by hand, you edit. It's you know it's the snowflake effect. You know your server is a snowflake, and that's fine. But as soon as you start with to deal with ten, fifteen, twenty. That just goes out of control. You can't um, you can't really maintain more than um, five machines without such a uh, tool. I mean, um, yeah. Can please? Yeah. So. Um, I know that you know even with a production setup, you might not have more than four or five servers, so you might think you can get away without any configuration management. But um, this, you know, if you have a lot of capture agents, that's something that you definitely want, you know, configuration management. For example, if you want to change, you know, uh, the capture settings, you know, of because the quality is too low, you don't want to have to go to 50 capture agents and change them one by one. Yeah. Everybody get that? The, the, the capture agents are the piece of hardware and, and um, configuration that's going to be the most likely the, the most uh, spread, I mean, the highest number. So that's most likely the, the area you, uh, you want your configuration management uh, tooling in place. If I may interrupt your, yeah, your sure. presentation for a quick second, because there are capture agent vendors in the room. And I'm wondering how, how the capture agent vendors envision management of, of 200 capture agents? You know, you, you want to switch to a different ingest server or you want to change a device name or, or you want to reboot all of them for some reason? Is there APIs in place? Are, there, are you selling management consoles for that? Any ideas how to do that? Is this on? Is it? Okay, there we go. Um, Likewise, I have a similar question. What happens if you have a mixed capture agent environment? You've got, you know, you've, I don't want to throw out any names here, but just to pick a few, we've got an NCAST agent and a 323 link agent. How on earth am I going to manage both of these from a single console? This seems like it's going to be very tough to do. Um, well, I can, answer, I can answer the first question, which is how, how we manage a, a number of uh, capture agents at the same time. And that is through, through the REST API of the capture agent. Um, uh, things like upgrading all the firmwares at the same time, uh, rebooting all of those, that's, easy, that's really easy to script using curl. Um, and that's, that's how I do it. We don't really have a management console. Um, we, we've sort of been waiting to see what um, oh well, the the other half of that, uh, I can I can tell you what I've been thinking about, which is we've been sort of waiting for a little bit of um, uh, question asking or leadership or or, or any kind of uh, prodding from the community to say, okay, this is what we need in Matterhorn, uh, not only in terms of um, simple administration, rebooting, um, uh, and so on. Um, Right. Well, well, there, there, there's sort of two two ways to look at configuration. One is one is the simple configuration where you you put it in a classroom, you tell it how how you how you want to do it, how how it's to be done, and then theoretically, then it's done. That that part of configuration is done. But then uh, later on, if you want to say change the Matterhorn server on on everything, um, that could be scripted. But other than that, I think I think. Um, uh, I don't see a lot of I don't see a lot of things that would fit inside Matterhorn itself to configure multiple different vendors of, of uh, capture agents. Um, this is my thought. I think um, for, uh, if I'm to pick uh, capture agents and I have 200 to pick, first of all, most likely I'm going to keep it to the same, just from you know, and then second, if I have 200 to pick, certainly if there's a con console management. That's going to be a plus. You know, if I can update, if I have an easy way to update the 200, you know, or if I need to go to each one to update the firmware or to change a setting, that's going to be a, a, a decision maker. Um, I mean, for me at least, it would be for sure. 
Oh, oh, one thing that I wanted to add. Um, one thing that is useful for communication between the capture agent and the Matterhorn server is all of the, um, um, that's the word I'm looking for, <laughs> um, metrics and, and, uh, and validation uh, that's going on in, in, the, in the capture agent, um, making sure the audio levels are correct and, and, and there's actual video, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, or something that we should standardize in Matterhorn so that that can uh, uh, so that can be the same across vendors. Anybody else wants to comment on capture agents configuration? So I guess the, the answer is if you're building your own or if they're open, uh, use the configuration management tool. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to second that that um, it would be nice to have a, a contract between Matterhorn and the capture agents on what the capture agents may and may not do, and also you know certain standards or an expected communication level other than just the ingest you know between if you're going to put a capture agent, what kind of data can you get from that da that agent? I think Greg has an answer. Yeah, there there is actually a document on the wiki containing that already. Um, it's not finished yet, um, but basically it outlines what the capture agent is expected to perform in terms of um, state keeping and um, capability um, information. But yeah, there isn't anything there isn't anything solid about configuration management yet, or about um, confidence monitoring yet. I mean, there is where's Rudiger? There is some um, code from Osnabrück that does configuration, or not configuration, confidence monitoring. Um, but it's, some people, it works for some people, it work, doesn't work for others, so it's still sort of, it's coming, but it's not all the way there yet. So there isn't anything solid about that yet. The capture agent does have, in theory, uh, support for loading configurations from the core, just pulling it down on a pole. It's actually in the same thread as um, pulling for its configuration locally. But that's in general turned off because the core doesn't have support for serving those yet. We just didn't have time to write that. Um, so if this, I mean, there is the beginnings of this. If there's a big push from the community to have this standardized, I'm more than, well, more than willing to take part. Um, the tough part is right now everything's assuming that it's serving Java property files across, which I can completely understand that some vendors probably aren't running Java locally, so that's going to be a pain to parse. But... That that'd be easy enough to fix, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it depends on how it's being fed out. But yeah, in, in general, I think it's fair to say that as we're looking um, at deployments that are um, increasing the number of their capture agents, so think of of Manchester's um, potential 200 capture agents. There needs to be a solution, you know, of some sort because it's it's impossible to manage 200 capture agents in a in an efficient way if there's no, no automation. And um, so I, I would welcome the, the manufacturers um, to, you know, to be visible on list and start discussing um, approaches like this. Right? We, can, we can come up with ideas. And I think we have been successful in, in providing a very simple API that the capture agents can talk to, to do in JSON scheduling. I mean, maybe it's not as simple as I'm thinking, but there is an API. And, and it seems that multiple capture agent manufacturers were able to successfully implement, and I, I think we need another round of, of API definition at some point, you know, to, to close the loop. Uh, I get, <clears throat> can speak for NCAST. We um, will be shortly announcing an NCAST management dashboard to handle a fleet of capture agents, and uh, also implementing SNMP support within the capture agent for the Nagios kind of monitoring. So we're, we're on our way to getting that solved. Uh, but we would like to see this integrated into the capture agent page in Matterhorn. And I don't think that's a well-defined area yet. So we, at the moment, are keeping that outside of the, the server. One more. Well. We as uh, Teltec for the Gallicaster capture agent, we are um, the bigger current installation that we know. It's 
about 40 uh, capture, cap Gallicasters capture agents in production. And um, we are currently working in a big kind of visual dashboard that gives information about the, the state with red lights and, and so. And also you are able to um, uh, remotely connect to the user interface, same user interface that professor has on the touch screen. You can remote uh, have access and manage it, confidence monitor of audio levels and, and so on. But so a, a, work, a work in progress. Is And I, I want to speak to the 323 link. Um, we're also a work in progress. We're um, working now to introduce um, this year, um, probably in the third quarter, um, a new version of our management system. So um, if there are requirements that can be agreed upon and, and published for manufacturers, then um, we are very interested in taking those into consideration as we develop our, our newest version. Yeah, the configuration of the capture agent is, as, as we have all um, heard now, it it's, can be a pressure point or pain point it, because there are a lot of them. So uh, that's for sure something that the community has to uh, get some uh, agreements on. Um, the, the whole um, thing about configuration management, misspelled, um, is um, Ultimately, it's, it's running um, infrastructure as code. So um, you don't really work on your machines anymore. You're declaring cookbooks or manifests. Uh, can be challenging when you're, you know, uh, some cur learning curve. Um, but uh, the idea behind this is um, the automation of system administration. So in, in case, uh, my point being that there's a lot that the developers can also bring to this uh, area um, because uh, they bring in dev developer practices to the configuration management. Um, and there's a lot of collaboration potential right there. So um, one thing that I didn't mention about DevOps, so that there's like four things. Uh, it's called uh, the camps. Uh, the C is for collaboration, and that's culture, collaboration, it's, it's really the main thing about DevOps moments, like bringing people together, breaking silos. And um, the, the A is uh, for automation, and uh, I've covered it all in that there is pipeline. The M is for metrics or measurement, and I'll get to, uh, I think I've showed the, the, the Java melody or, or the uh, profiling, that, that's one area. And the S is for sharing, and that's, that's why it's also the, this open source um, uh, tool explosion. Yeah, I mean, is it is it true that um, configuration management would also facilitate um, setting up and spawning staging um, environments? Yes, completely. So, again, since you're running infrastructure as code, in, in, in if we go back to the um, release pipeline, um, if you're looking at the uh, the ephemeral staging, so you push a new RPM. But uh, your RPM are only as good as uh, its default settings, and your ephemeral, ephemeral staging is a distributed environment. The default, the default settings are not meant for a distributed environment because you cannot obviously configure uh, all your nodes uh, as the same default, right? So, um, <coughs> the, the typical workflow is you use a tool like Vagrant, uh, which is like a high layer of, of the virtual uh, environment, to spawn four, five, six, whatever, uh, the number of virtual machines you need. And then you provision it uh, with something like Chef or Puppet saying, you know, um, nodes of profile admin uh, do uh, have this configuration. Um, uh, the nodes of type worker have this configuration, et cetera. So obviously what you can do in production to, to uh, configure your production system can be uh, uh, bring one step backward in, into the staging uh, uh, process. So the idea behind being automation, automation and automation, is just automate as much as you can because um, it's, it's just remove the human error out of, of this uh, pipe 
you know, and, and it is just, at the end of the day, you know, everybody wants to uh, work on things that are interesting, right? So manual tasks, not so much. Automation, much more interesting. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, Will, will you be talking about the combo of configuration management and Vagrant? Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow? Uh, I'll, I'll or today? say how it works, and it's, it's embedded in Vagrant. So, um, but it, it, right now, there is no uh, chef or poop and manifest uh, for other ones. So. Um. OK, uh, <clears throat> this is a big um, focus point. Um, the dev prod parity. Um, I think everybody here is familiar with this uh, phrase, and stop me if you're not. It works on my machine, right? That's like you. Heard, you it's a classic, and and that's what this is uh, trying to uh, fight. Having the developer environment as close as possible to the uh, production environment. Um, Vagrant is, is one tool that facilitates that. And you can run it locally on your laptop, and you don't have to uh, <coughs> connect to any you know, remote staging data center area, VPN. No, you just like start it on this. Um, if you look into it, you'll see this. Uh, it's, it's very easy to deploy your own um, staging inside your, your laptop instead of running things like Ombu on, on Mac or uh, whatever you need on, on Windows to have a, a Linux environment. Uh, I, I'm kind of pushing for um, Linux, and that's what you know. I'm not considering um, you know running Matterhorn in, in OS X or Windows. It's certainly possible, but um, you know it's just we open source, and uh, I think uh, there's plenty uh, of uh, advantages <laughs> to, to run to running it in, in Linux. So on my laptop, when I need to test things. For Matterhorn, I spawn uh, a new VM using Vagrant that has uh, our distribution uh, CentOS with uh, our configuration, and uh, that's where I work. Connect my, uh, and you can connect your ID to it. Um, you know, just uh, it has shell folders and so forth. Um, the 12 factor app, if you haven't read about it, it's an interesting read. Um, it's like 12 factor about developing. Uh, modern software as a service, service-oriented application. So uh, one of the uh, points is in a traditional desktop application, the, the time between deploys is weeks. The code authors and the code deployers are different people, and the production and development environment are different, or they diverge. In the 12-factor app, the, you can deploy in a matter of hours. That, that release pipeline that I showed, you know, you can just, like, it, it's... It really uh, enhances the, the, the also the developers' work because suddenly you don't have to wait two, three, four days, whatever, a year to see your code in production. Right when that when that loop is is uh, fast and it's constantly accelerating, it, it you can also get your user feedback faster. So it, it's really a win-win uh, uh, proposition. Dev, dev gets its feedback faster. Uh, operation gets to uh, uh, maintain a, a pipeline and not manual. Uh, firefighting. Um, yeah, so the code authors versus code deployers, uh, that's, it's a, I think it's a still a, something of a, an argument or discussion between, you know, uh, should the, the operations people just maintain the pipeline and provide just a service for the developers to be able to um, go from their code right into production and see it uh, run? Um, it, it certainly has uh, some uh, um, value to, to it. Um, I've seen many in the institutions I've worked, I've seen developers going shadow IT and start spawning their own uh, Amazon uh, instances. Um, you know, instead of just because it's faster, because they don't have to you know, get uh, uh, 200 uh, uh, people to approve to get their new instance. So. Um, that's where this, this uh, collaboration can facilitate that um, at, at your own institutions. So. I, I would like to add a little context, if you don't mind, sure. just to, to um, as an example. So our developers are pure developers, I would say, including myself. I'm a real developer. I live in, my, you know, in, in Eclipse, basically. 
Um, and recently, with putting these tools in place that Jaime is talking about, um, the developers are, are uh, capable and also forced <laughs> to do full deployments. So every one of our developers that are really only coders, quote unquote, are now able to, to deploy things on server, um, do an analysis of the production software that is running. You know, they have all the tools they know. And by doing that and also learning, you know, what's missing, you know, they go in, they don't find some information. And uh, I mean, the answer is obvious why, why these things are missing. It's because it's not in the code they wrote. Right, and so this is a, a fantastic feedback loop and, and leads to much, much better code overall. So he, what, what he's talking about here seems, seems like some random, random ops <laughs> thoughts, um, but it, it, actually, it actually leads to, leads to better code. And it's highly, I think it's, uh, it's to be pushed. Yeah, and then and, uh, you know, I'm one guy here standing out in front of you. Uh, this doesn't, I'm just like, you know, standing on the shoulder of giants that are doing this, you know, at Amazon and Netflix, uh, you name it. You know, that, that's, they could not run thousands of servers, literally, without this kind of uh, processes in place. So certainly what works for this, you know, large installation uh, can work for uh, Matterhorn. And, uh, you know, there is a potential to have hundreds of Matterhorn servers, you know, so, um, or nodes, so certainly uh, this uh, kind of practices should be favored. Um, <coughs> Jaime, can I yeah. again? Excuse yeah. me. Can I get a show of hands? Who, who of those who is running Matterhorn, who is having a separate operations team that is not the developers? Okay. And and who is having a mixed approach? So the developers deploy and run Matterhorn. Any opinions, findings, feedback? Are there any tools that you use that Jaime maybe didn't mention or, or left out? Or is it developers that know how to log into a Linux box? Not specifically on that, but I mean, as developers, we're trying to use the VMs, but then all our machines have to be upgraded, and you need so much more RAM and, and disk space. We're having a bit of growing pains finding the best fit for us, too. And then um, I'm sure operations are having similar growing pains. We haven't gotten to the point where we could really say, let's you know use this type of tool because we have these types of requirements. But we'll sure we'll get there. Yeah, <laughs> DevOps is just a word. Just get your developers in the same mood with the people that are running the servers. You know, whatever the name is, a system admin or operation or whatever. It's the people writing the code and the people that are running it. You know, get them together and say, you know, like, do you have? This, does this log statement make sense to you? Or you know, um, and then the operation people are say, hey, you know, I just threw two, uh, you know, threw two uh, events and the database is crawling. Um, this, this is really getting people together that, that um, uh, facilitates. And th I think this is a good example of why this collaboration um, needs to uh, happen. So <coughs> um, Matterhorn, distributed environment, you can have several nodes. Let's say you have 10 workers, a workflow fails. You don't, I mean, right now, there, there is, um, if you don't have anything like that, there is really like the admin doesn't tell you which node was running, which host was running, you know, the, the, the operation that failed. Uh, so you kind of left to go to each worker and look at the logs. And um, so to, to kind of circumvent that, but only to a certain point, we uh, deployed a Greylog 2, and uh, we have a, a jar available that, that's compliant with Matterhorn that uh, we. Um, I wrote about this and I published it. So anybody that wants to run Greylog 2 uh, is more than welcome to uh, uh, read my tutorial and install our jar, and, and uh, you should be uh, good to go. So what this gives, it's, it, it's uh, an extension to um, uh, Log4j in the jar, and, and then uh, you configure your log for, uh, Greylog 2 server, um, get your operations people to do that. <laughs> um, it's, it can be a little tricky, so... Um, 
if, if you want to, as a developer, you can also install it. I'm just, anyway, um, that, could, that uh, extension to uh, uh, that appender to uh, log4j then uh, talks to your uh, Gradoc2 server, ships all the logs. Uh, you can still uh, sh uh, log to file or log somewhere else. You know, it's just uh, adding another appender. Um, and then in Gradoc2, you, you can, um, all the all the logs are um, class, uh, sorted out, and you can search. And there's a lot of uh, things you can do. But um, I think one of the the big things is you have permalinks to your logs, so you can you know have discussions about you know and, and have a link versus having a giant stack trace that is passing through tickets or through emails. Uh, you can search, and and it's centralized, you know, in, in a web interface. But <coughs> Um, and also, uh, it's going to say from which host it's coming, so you can identify, you know, make groups of workers, and then uh, the thing is, this is only as good as the logs that are in there, right? If if you're uh, if if <laughs> if there is no log, it cannot be centralized. So this is only as good as uh, what the developers are uh, writing in the logs, right? <coughs> so it, it, it's it's. Uh, it's quite important that um, there's a consensus uh, in the community uh, about how to log and um, what should be log, uh, etc. Um, there, there's a if you're interested in um, log management, there's plenty of tools and reading. Um, I have some uh, further reading at the end of, of um, this presentation that um, I, I would certainly. Um, I uh, would be very happy to see the uh, community uh, follow these uh, logging rules. Uh, they're pretty standard, and most of those rules are already uh, followed, like you know, using uh, log4j, I mean, a, a, a logging framework. So it's just certain things that are missing. Uh, for instance, context. You know, uh, nobody likes to see a log that says transaction failed. You know, it's like uh, you know, waking up at 3 a.m. with your Pager and it's like you see a log that says transaction failed. Like, so, um, Tobias um, mentioned this already, so I'm not gonna. The caveats um, for those who, who know what uh, Hadoop is, um, this uh, the Hadoop cluster to, man to manage the Hadoop cluster. It's uh, we just need to be careful that the the surrounding uh, that we build to kind of you know contain. Or uh, feel the missing parts, just not does outgrow uh, um, Matterhorn itself. A lot of what I've said um, could be and, and should be bring back within Matterhorn. Um, I think a big uh, piece that is missing right now is, is uh, instrumentation. Um, the, 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 there's no it's it's, it's tough to to. Uh, even understand the admin UI or there's things that are just not there, you know, like the, the ingest, you know, the, the the rate of the ingest or when did it start or when did it stop. It, it, it's, um, it's it's okay to uh, kind of find, um, you know, side, side services or tools that you can put in place, but um, I think a lot of this needs to be um, embedded within Matterhorn. All this knowledge, all this, um, Points that I think the operations force can bring up um, sh should be <coughs> built in or plugins or you name it. Uh, so um, hopefully we we, uh, we can get there. Um, in that um, perspective, uh, there's um, there's a lot of um, open source tools out there that have, and most of them well. They're for operations people. It, it's you know they've been, you know they came from the uh, operations side and and uh, you know it, it's no mystery that uh, Jenkins or Rundeck or Logstash uh, you know developers were you know sysadmins or uh, you know a few years ago and then you know they saw this and they're like well someone needs to do something about it. So there's a lot of um, um, I think guidance we can take from these other projects um, that that I think we you know as um, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, you know looking at what others are doing right and uh, you know uh, inspiring you know I, I think it's uh, 
if you look at these tools, they have a repository that provides RPM, that provides uh, deb, um, you know, and they, uh, you know, they push updates every two days, and you know, they follow this uh, um, methodology or, or um, movement. Um, so um, <coughs> I just wanted to, um, it's, well, it might fail, but it's, uh, so the, there's, um, at least what I've seen a lot is um, the different of perspective from developers and operations people. And um, this is how the developers um, see themselves as, you know, the, the man of steel, you know. I can solve anything with code. <laughs> it's invincible, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, can do anything. And this is how, how they see the operations people. A grandpa from up, you know, that's always grumpy. Uh, the main, the main word coming out of his mouth is no. It doesn't work. You know? And you know, there's some truth to, to both of these uh, images. Um, then there's uh, the operation people perspective. So uh, who we think we are, we're Batman. You know, it's like we're in the dark. We're in our data centers fixing things, and you know, out of you know, like sometimes we have to go outside of the regular way of doing things, but ultimately, you know, we get things done. Oh, yeah, the tool belt. And this is how I've, you know, seen the, the ops, seeing the devs, <laughs> the joker, you know, it's like this chaotic <laughs> person just like wants to destroy my systems, pushing code that breaks everything, that wakes me up at 3 a.m., you know. <laughs> and uh, the truth is, and I've seen this uh, at Antwine, and um, I, I've seen this switch. You know, uh, last year I was at the uh, was my first in conference, and I was bringing all these questions, and I, I it didn't seem to uh, have much impact. But I have seen the shift happening, um, and uh, I'm confident. You know, in in, in 2013, it's going to be the the year of uh, you know the Batman and Superman together to uh, get things done. So. And for those who are comics fans, this is the Justice League. So. <laughs> That's it. So, any questions or comments? Anybody want to react to the uh, grumpy ops guys from from up? <laughs> John wants to react to that. One question, if we install Vagrant, that gives us basically a vir distributed virtual environment on our, on yeah. our laptop. Yeah. And so uh, how, how, much, how much RAM does that typically take? Well, it depends on how many. Uh, say I have four, two yeah. workers, one admin, and one engaged. So I'm, I'm, I'm a system guy, so. I have eight gigs of RAM. And so do I. I have yeah. an SSD. And but I, I also have an IDE that soaks up incredible amounts. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's so. Uh, I was. Um, I had the chance to talk with the Vagrant developer, and uh, he's running uh, six, seven VMs on his MacBook Air, and he's also developing. He's developing Vagrant, so he has his IDE. So uh, I'm running four VMs to, for that purpose, for to have a distributed environment. Uh, Vagrant supports that. The, the, I'll, I'll show Vagrant um, tomorrow um, in more detail, but it's, it's a real cool tool. You like do all, you know, all your crap, all your destructive, all your, all your tests, and then you just do a Vagrant destroy that removes everything, and you just do Vagrant up, and boom, your four VMs are back up at the same state they were before you did all your testing. So it, it's very, very uh, useful. Yeah, you have. Well, we use our RPM, so I just push the RPM. But ideally, so Vagrant has a chef, puppet, or shell provisioner. So when you, sp you spawn your new uh, VM, Vagrant is going to look for a chef or a, a puppet or a shell a script. And then easy, you know, just push a shell script that install Matterhorn. Or, uh, for us, it's, it's uh, the package. So it, it certainly is it's all these things really glue very well together. But you can, you know. Write things outside of uh, that. that um. 
Hank? Uh, I mean, yeah. This uh, set of tools requires um, a learning curve and another whole bunch of packages to install. At, at what point um, is there a payoff in utilizing these tools versus just sort of a bare metal installation of, of Matterhorn? Um, <clears throat> it's, it's certainly, you know, when you're running four VMs and you have two capture agents, you know, it's like, do I really need to go through all the pain of um, this? But um, it's certainly, without the, that, that tool chain, you just won't scale. So if, you, uh, if you're small and you're always going to stay small and you're doing everything by hand, um, I, I, I'm not sure about the limit. For me, um, I would say, uh, you know, running more than 10 VMs or 10 servers um, without any kind of automation, that's already the, the end of it. it it's, um, after 10, five is already painful, uh, but uh, above 10, I don't know, Kevin, uh, uh, if you have any input uh, as to uh, the configuration management or logging. Um. But um, at UC Berkeley, we're just doing our pilot this semester, so we are anticipating all these problems once we scale up. So it's very helpful that you know I'm not I wasn't aware of Vagrant, for example. So you know, that's something that we would definitely look at. And Hank's right, you know, there's going to be a steep learning curve depending on you know how much operations people you have. Um, how much knowledge they have about the Matterhorn development process, you know. Um, yeah, no, because you know, um, just because there's tools out there, you have to first work together first, right? You mm -hmm. know, if your your university is kind of more siloed, um, your ops and dev people haven't been working together closely. Just because you know the ops people have set a vagrant, that doesn't mean they're going to start using it. So. Yeah, no, it's. Uh it's it's a it's a very uh, valid point, but um, and has been bring before. And um, for my answer is, my specialty is change. You know, as I've always had to adapt, and I've seen people saying, you know, oh, I was running Novel in these days, and now I'm, you know, I was running Open Solaris, and you know, it's um, it's just the it's the you know it's the nature of the trade. Uh, I, I'm a generalist. Uh, by, um, you know, because that's what I had to do to, to maintain and to uh, bring systems up. Uh, you know, the network protocols that change every, you know, it's, I think from the developer perspective, this perspective, it might be a little different because you can do all your life just being a, a Java programmer, but uh, in, in operations, you're never going to have all your life being, a, I don't know, uh, an Apache or a MySQL database administrator. Um, some people are, but most, most of the time, you just have to switch to the new uh, set of uh, tools or techniques that are coming. So that, that learning curve is part of the, the, uh, the, the, the trade. You know? We have to adapt and constantly you know, uh, get to uh, make decisions about the right tool and, and the right um, uh, pipeline to put in place and, and so forth. So, um, as to uh, the learning curve for all these tools, some of them are more complex than others. Um, config management certainly can be uh, more challenging than just using Vagrant. Or, but you know, we were not doing virtualization five years ago, right? So there was learning curve. We had to adapt, right? We were running hardware and you know, dedicated physical. Machines and suddenly it's like virtualization. You have to do it. Okay. So if it's it's more of a, it's the nature of the, of our work and people that don't can't adapt to that pace. Um, they they it's it's tough. It's tough not to be able. To, uh, but so yeah, five. If you if you if you are under five VM and capture agents and um, but the thing is for Matterhorn for the community. It, it, there's no, there's no such number, right? The, the, the Matterhorn uh, code needs to be adoptable by anybody, right? whether it's two machines or 200, right? And and so those those uh, practices 
uh, need to be uh, put in place if, if we want to uh, provide uh, an environment for the adopters to, to scale to 200 or, or to whatever they want to go, I think. I, mean, I don't know. That's, I don't know if anybody has a, a comment about that. But it's, it's upfront money, but it's an investment. And uh, uh, I know at Antwine there's been a, you know, I've been pushing for these tools and, you know, there was, you know, this, of course you don't see nothing for the first, you know, uh, the time it takes to implement it. And then suddenly things start to, you know, people see uh, Greylog 2 and they start using Rundeck. There's just one click to do deployment and so forth. So uh, it's, it's, it certainly is, is worth uh, more often than not. And you don't have to do the full, you know, full scale tool chain, you know, like entire automated release pipeline. You just start with the Jenkins build, uh, build server. You know, Jenkins has a Maven plugin. It's a matter of, you know, install Jenkins. Um, uh, just start a project, you know, connect to, uh, I wrote a post about that. So, it, you know, it, it's really, it's like, uh, I don't know, uh, 20, 20 lines or 30 lines read and just configure a Maven project, uh, get your repo. And you build, and then already you have your jars. Already you're not compiling on your local machines, and uh, you can already move away from uh, the, the, the more developer-oriented deployment methodology. And I, I, I think just getting started with, with a single tool, let's, let's take Rundeck. No, let's take uh, Greylog as an example. It allows the developers to take a look at the production system without having to talk to, to the system engineer and ask, like, could you please send me the logs? Could you please, you know, log in for me and do X, Y, Z? And this is already a, a, a great advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, allow the developers um, better insight. They don't necessarily have to do the deployment as well, you know, and shut down the systems and things like that. But, you know, get, getting them closer to what the system engineer is seeing is certainly an advantage and, and certainly worth um, going through setting, setting up these things. And especially, I mean, m most people in, that I know, and uh, including myself, I'm usually thinking about the production um, environment, right? This is what we're all aiming for. We're looking at a up and running production environment, but what it what this takes is it, it takes a staging environment all almost all the time. Sometimes it even um, includes a development environment where people can just hack around, you know, because it may not be feasible to have virtual machines run on on developer machines for resource reasons. So as soon as you start working with multiple um, environments that all may consist of, of a distributed setup, you know, you're immediately looking at, at maybe 12 virtual machines. And, you know, the more machines you add, the, the lower um, or, or the, the, <laughs> the higher the likelihood is that you would come to appreciate um, these tools. Yeah, and then just keep in mind the tools are great, but it's um, people, process, technology and don't go the other way. Don't start with a tool and then uh, get people, throw the tool at them and say, hey, easy, use this. You know, Before we, we started with Greylog 2, with Rundeck, with any of this, you know, there was a discussion among ourselves. It's like, what, what are we trying to achieve with this tool? Who's going to look at it? Um, what, what's the purpose of it, uh, et cetera? So just get that in the right order versus coming from the, so the same thing for the community for this release pipeline, I think. Um, you know, there's, there's no, um, just, just build a complete automatic pipeline for, for what? Who's going to maintain it? What, what's the point, right? Um, so there must be an agreement that, hey, we're going to have a Jenkins build server or Travis or, you know, whatever. For what purpose? Who's going to maintain it? Um, so the, this, these discussions um, that also are, uh, can be, you know, time consuming, but uh, they're important to have uh, before getting into the, the tooling side of it. So one last comment. Okay. You. Um, but about all these techniques, my question would be, how do I get as a developer up to date with all that you want to introduce and that I can, or that we as committers after that can make a decision what would be uh, the technique that we uh, should use? So um, in a way, I guess... Um, like we lack documentation for other stuff, um, 
we would uh, need documentation or at least an introduction, a frequent introduction to these techniques yeah. okay. within the deaf meeting or whatever if we should go in that direction. Otherwise, uh, I would not see on which... Uh, yeah. There, I mean, there's there's a reason why why we allow Jaime to to get up on stage. <laughs> it's always you may fall asleep, but you, but you may also have to listen for hours and hours because he can keep going forever. Yeah. And and all of this all of this together, I mean, what we what we would love to see is is more uptake um, when it comes to to operations people, people that are actually running Matterhorn in production, the guys sitting in the data center. We would love to see them at the developers meeting and Jaime will um, soon propose on list it's the most important thing to him to change the name of the developer meeting to something that inc is more inclusive in terms of you know operations too maybe devops meeting or or something like that mm. not sure what the proposal will be yeah. but um the the goal is ultimately to see more people um at the meetings that know about operations that may be lacking um knowledge about the, the development part so we can start talking together. In a way, uh, I'm looking at Greg in the back a little bit. Uh, we c probably could uh, change a little bit the structure of the dev meeting too, as uh, at the moment we are mostly reviewing tickets and so on, and probably saying, okay, we have 30 minutes of the meeting for um, some um, yeah, information that somebody prepared as a talk for us. And one of the reasons is that, that Jaime is, mo in most cases, the only system engineer that is at the meeting. I, I see Kevin uh, occasionally. Um, you know, Jonathan is showing up here and there, but that's about it. And if, if I'm on list, you know, I, I keep reading on list, hey, we're running this Matterhorn installation, and, I'm, you know, we're running to this and that, and where are these people, and, and why are they not coming? Because I'm, what, what I would like to, to ask, and maybe someone has, has initial opinions, so if, if, if there's something, I'm running the software and it's not working and it's difficult to operate, you know, am I not doing anything about that? Mm. Or, or what do I do about it? And one, one way at least I see it, I mean, it is open source. Um, it comes with a price, right? You need to, to develop certain things yourself. You can't just wait for a company to add this, this new feature. On the other hand, it's it's a great opportunity. You can send your operations people to the you know to the dev meeting, uh, and tell everyone like I, I need more logging. I need you know why is this not documented? This is breaking, you know. I can't load a workflow because there's JavaScript and the whole admin UI is, is down and these kind of things. Yeah, there's uh, certainly the going you know it's like we we need to be this. It's really that's what this. Is about is breaking the, those silos, and um, I think we need a structured way, and, and that's what this proposal is. Changing the name is, is a symbol, but I think it's an important symbol. You know, as when I was outside of the Matterhorn community, uh, I remember seeing you know one of the communication channels was a developers meeting, and I am not a developers meeting, so I am not going to go to the developers meeting by default. You know, it's it's as simple as that. It's the naming. I mean, you know, you name your variables in a way that. You can uh, identify them. Same, same idea. So, um, a, a structured way where we can, you know, um, get all together and, and solve this. Because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, right? Developers want their code to be run as much as possible in as many places in the world as possible, and the operations people want, you know, the code to, you know, to be operational. So, um, it's, it's there's a um, there's no reason we cannot break those uh, those walls and uh, through uh, a structured way. Uh, you know, I, I'm personally I'm I'm quite optimistic. I, I think um, in the past um, few months I've seen the improvements and um, I, you know he would have talked to me at the last time conference I was at Oxford. I was not that optimistic, but you know after this one I, I'm you know truly uh, genuinely optimistic about. Uh, bringing all these uh, people together to improve the, the, the situation. So I think we're going to see in the next couple of months a, a lot of uh, um, you know, like improvements from, from that perspective in all areas. Okay, well, on that optimistic note, let's uh, thank Jaime. Um, before we break for lunch, I just wanted to do a quick check and see if there are any impromptu sessions or outbreak uh, breakouts. Excuse me, 
that people wanted to um, announce for the day? No? Okay. I think we're breaking until 1.30. Uh, we come back, there'll be the um, Capture Agent Showcase, which will go, I think, till 3, 1.30 to 3. Yeah. Um, so uh, with that, unless there's any additional comments, we're, we're off for lunch. So enjoy your lunch.